Perspective Shift is brought to you by fdailycoaching.com. If you're seeking assistance to help navigate you through a difficult time or feel challenged to reach your full potential, Frank Daly can guide you to a perspective that will allow you to utilize your imagination and experience a more fulfilling and satisfying life. Frank has been working with people for over 20 years as a coach, helping them understand the power they have to transform their lives. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Wonderful, Frank. Good to see you. Same here, man. Back here for another week of Perspective Shift. Who yes. are we covering today? Uh, Bashar. Bashar. Yeah, Bashar. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. But yeah. Back for round two. We've had the privilege of covering Bashar, Mr. Daryl Anka, or excuse me, Daryl Anka in the past yeah. year before. Yeah, exactly. So we're, I, it was probably over a year ago we did him, but uh, it's been a while. Yeah, but it's been a while, maybe more than a year. I was gonna say he has a bunch of new cool content that's been coming out. Yeah, and he's pretty profound in his understanding, getting right to the point. He's very, very concise and precise with his information. That's what I like. It's concise r- is a yeah, great word he gets to right, describe. Right it. to it, right to it, which mm-hmm. I like. I enjoy that part of it. No, absolutely. Yeah, so. Um, uh, about uh, Bashar, what's some stuff that we want to share? So uh, Bashar is somebody who is an entity that is channeled by Mr. Daryl Anka. Yeah. Um, Daryl Anka, he was born in 1971. Uh, no, right? 1950. Or 1950, excuse yeah. me. Yeah, 1950, <laughs> yeah. 1951. <laughs> I was going to say he started this in the 70s. What else do we want to chat about, Mr. Um, yeah, he's been channeling for 40 years now, so it's uh, four decades. The other thing, too, is he actually talks about this a lot of times, like when I went to him, see him, he was talking about this previous, that everybody, um, channeling is a natural state, a natural altered state. So everyone does this when you get caught up in something, say at work, we just kind of get into zone, you're channeling. Um, and what he does is he channel, uh, gets into this altered state and he's channeling what he's, uh, what he come to know as his future self, which is Bashar. And Bashar just means uh, messenger. It's not really the entity's name, but it's given the name for uh, intent the purposes of us to explain what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and even with him, he's, um, you know, anyone new to this type of material, um, it could seem a little bizarre at first, but when you actually just sit back and get over the fact that he's channeling, it's the information coming through, it's, you'll know it's sound. Once you absorb it in and utilize it, um, you realize there's something about this information that comes through, and it's pretty, it's pretty life changing. So, two things. Number one, uh, I love how you talked about, you know, channeling is something we all do. Uh, that's how I feel when I sit down and do perspective shifts with you. You channeling? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel like it's like yeah, a, it's a complete letting go. You kind of get into this trance state, and you allow everything to, you know, speak through you. Yeah, and time just flies by. We don't even you know? time ourselves. We just well, that's it. what I mean. Yeah. When you're uh, having a cup of coffee with your friend, and you're engaged in this great conversation. Um, that's you channeling, you know, uh, I think that's a, a great way to describe what he's doing because again, we put so much mystery, um, behind certain things or we, we, uh, we make something into something when we all have the ability to do, you know, these exact very same things. Yeah. And it, um, won't, some will call it intuitive intuition, what have you, but, uh, he obviously has a capacity to channel an entity, outside himself and i think he he labels it's like 300 years into his future yeah he's had 500 uh, years yeah yep all right so you're talking about the um the uh, it, uh bashar yeah 500 years uh, 500 light years away yeah something like yeah that. yeah so and it's just an entity um that he's attached to from a planet called essasani um and these all, all this information can be found on his website and everything else but for me i'm like i find that to be cool but for me it's more about the information to live my day-to-day life here on planet earth and how to get through this uh physical world and how to elevate higher to where you're actually just um witnessing it not getting caught up caught up in the day-to-day stuff yeah. which a lot of people are and um you know one of the first videos i'm going to show you is about how uh, humanity actually is lifting. Mm-hmm. Um, again, if you watch the news, you don't notice that. <laughs> <laughs> you would never think that. You would no. think we're being pulled into the depths of hell and yeah. how divided we are as a country. But the other thing, too, is another put a positive spin on the news because if we put a negative spin, we're going to get a ne- negative reaction. We put a positive spin, we'll get a positive reaction. When I look at the news, if I do look at the news and I see things that are going wrong, 
The news is only showing you what is not common. Because if it was common, it wouldn't be news. So therefore, when you see all the negative aspect, it's kind of nice knowing this is not everyday stuff. It may shake your ground because we notice stuff that's out of place. So if you have a really clean house and there's a, say, a uh, drop of coffee on the floor, you're going to know a drop of coffee. But that the drop of coffee doesn't consume your house. It may consume your attention, mm -hmm. but it doesn't consume your house. You go up and wipe it up, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So the news is showing you drops a cup of coffee, but if you immerse yourself in the news, you think it's everywhere it's not. So it's a, way, a positive way of looking at the news so you can actually watch the news without getting pulled into it. Yeah. The, the second thing I want to mention before we dive in there, and you touched on it, but um, it, when I fr it, when I first saw Bashar, I was like, what the hell is this? I had like <laughs> no I I remember saying to myself, like, what? You know, because he, he talks, you know, in a very theatrical, you know, way. Almost like Captain Kirk. Yeah, like it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And so um, for those out there, I encourage you, keep an open mind, you know, when you're listening to this. Because a lot. I remember when I first heard of Bashar and I started to tune in, uh, It I had to really let go of, okay, you know, the conditioning that I grew up in and, and just the way we're taught to perceive things. You would think the guy's crazy is what I'm saying. And so as I started to listen to Bashar, you know, I I remember like, oh my God, this guy, he speaks so much truth. Like everything that's being shared right now, um, I can feel to be true. Like I, I know it in my bones. And so listen to the content that is being shared, not so much the way it's being delivered. Because that's uh, you want to keep an open mind when you're going into Bashar's content. Uh, content, um, at least I remember that was a big thing for me. So I want to encourage everybody in the audience: keep an open mind, um, listen for you know um, uh, how it affects you, how it affects your soul, how you feel. Yeah, and and over time you don't even notice it anymore. I've been listening to Bashar for many many years, so I don't even realize his tone anymore. I do notice like when when I go to see him, um, and even sometimes I've never seen Bashar. Yeah, and when they show some clips too, they'll do this, not often, but they'll actually have him prior to going under. So the cadence of uh, Daryl Anka's voice is a lot different than Bashar. It's softer. Um, I don't want to say kinder. It's not like Bashar is not kind. Mm -hmm. But he's just softer uh, feeling than when Bashar gets on. Um, you know, It's a complete change in his voice. I don't know if we have a clip showing that, but if you're interested, there are clips out there. But it is like he's like Daryl Anka is stepping aside and allowing... Uh, the energy of Bashar to come through because Daryl Anka speaks English. That's f therefore English is coming through. Mm -hmm. So it's a translation. So Daryl Anka's system or subconscious is translating the information coming through because it's coming through in like more of a uh, vibrational feeling, and then he's translating just like everything. Mm -hmm. If you, you you know if I feel a certain way, I have to I utilize words in order to express it. That's why we always get in trouble. <laughs> it never gets to the point. No, but you're you're absolutely right, and that's they they've done. You can also cool, see some uh, documentaries that they've done. They just did one on Gaia called Channeling. For anybody who's interesting, it's called Channeling, and they hook uh, Daryl up to you know different machines. Yeah, like the EMT or whatever the brain scan, you know, whatever that stuff's called, and um, they can they can see the moment when he his consciousness or when he switches into uh, Bashar. Like they can, they can actually read it and monitor it, yeah. and so it's very interesting. He actually is stepping away, like you're saying, yeah, from Daryl Anka, you know, his uh, third, you know, his identity in this three third dimensional world, and he uh, is consumed by Bashar. Yeah, and imagine even now if like if Daryl Anka, if they somehow had this uh, machinery or equipment, uh, say forty years ago, and they were measuring Daryl Anka's um, brain waves, imagine his brain waves are coming closer as an individual, separate from Bashar, closer to Bashar's now, but just because of, um, by proxy, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and so the, the reason I brought that up is when you get into a meditative state or you get lost in having a conversation with a friend, notice how you feel. If you, were, if your brain waves are being measured, they would be at high, high amplitude, um, you know, high measurement, a higher than, per second. yeah, higher than they were. So it's, um, and that's what meditation means, becoming familiar with. So the more we become familiar with feeling good, the easier it is for us to get there. And he shows you, um, obviously, one of the formulas, uh, 
I think in one of them he'll talk about it. If not, I'll go over it. But there is a formula for living life. And if you follow it, it works. It really does. Hell yeah. But uh, I'll see. I, I think what one of our clips will have it. If not, I'll I'll um, I'll say it, but just uh, rather have him say it. No, yeah. I, I love that. Yep. Let's dive into our first clip. All right, here is Bashar. Now that you have changed your collective consciousness, the vibration and frequency of your reality in such a manner as you have recently done, you have created a kind of shift, a kind of change that allows us now to proceed further with this agenda of assisting you in the balancing of this energy and allows us to move into different positions because now you have created on your planet a very different energy which can now accelerate in positive and constructive and creative and loving ways more than ever before. So first and foremost, we will congratulate you on making a change in your collective consciousness to allow us to interact with you in a new reality. So congratulations. Now, once again, allow us to explain briefly the idea of what the shift is about in terms of what is actually mechanically happening. We understand that in human language you have many colloquial phrases for this idea of transformation and changing your world. And that is all well and good and you can refer to this idea in any way, shape or form you so desire. It doesn't matter. The effect is the same. But the idea is that we would like to take a moment to explain to you mechanically, physiologically, what is happening. <clears throat> because sometimes when you understand the actual mechanism that you are employing in the change, it helps you make further changes, more profound changes, and have a more profound understanding of what kind of changes can be made. So, I know this is going to sound at first a little bit confusing, but that's all right. This is just an issue of semantics and language, and we will explain more clearly as we go along. So when we talk about the kind of changes that you are making and wish to make on your planet, we will begin this conversation by pointing out that nothing has changed. Why do we say that? I will tell you. Thank you. Here's what we mean by nothing has changed. The idea is, really, that when something in your world changes, the world you were in did not change. You changed. You shifted your frequency. You shifted your vibration. And by shifting your frequency, you have shifted your focus of consciousness to an already simultaneously coexisting parallel reality that is already existing on that frequency. You didn't change the world that was there. That world is still there. You have shifted to an already existing parallel reality that is reflective of the vibratory frequency you have shifted to personally. Thus, when you look around and see differences, it's because you have taken yourself, you have shifted yourself to a parallel Earth that already had those differences in it. The old Earth the other parallel reality still exists, still looks the same, didn't change. But you have changed your focus of consciousness. So the idea of helping people change, of helping to change your world, is the idea really of offering other people a point of view that contains a certain frequency, a certain pitch, a certain state of being. And if, 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 if they choose to match, to mirror that frequency you are offering that goes along with that different point of view, they then will see the difference in the world in which they have shifted to. They will see the difference in them reflected by the world they have shifted to. But again, the other world, still there, hasn't gone anywhere. All possible parallel realities exist now. I love that clip. Me too. I thought that was a great one to kick kind of things off with too. Yeah, it's an analogy that he uses. Uh, uses he didn't use in this situation, and when they talk about um, shifting to another reality, it's like if you're listening to a radio station, is a particular, um, say, rock, classic rock station, and you switch to, um, say, country. 
you're not changing the rock station. You're actually switching to a country station. So you, you're changing the frequency which is coming through the bandwidth through the radio. So you're actually changing frequencies there to get a different output of um, music, if you will, in this case. so when we That's a perfect example. Yeah, so a lot of people are sitting around waiting for the world to change. And we've heard this before, say, say like Mahatma Gandhi, become the change in which you want to see. So Bashar is actually telling you the mechanics of it. You don't change the world you're in. You change to the world in which you prefer. And that's what it is. So when you actually know that, you don't have to change the world around you. You don't need to protest. But if you want to, go for it. It doesn't matter because that's what's happening in that world. But if you really want to change, you must change the radio station if you want to hear a different type of music. And go a step further. When you say change the to the world you prefer, what do you mean? The change to the world you are. What are you vibrating at? What is your frequency? What is your what is your output? Yeah, and it's well, it's just different because again, like this, the the world you're in right now isn't necessarily bad. You're just done with it. And if you don't know how to get out of it, it's going to drive you nuts. So it's leave it alone, so to speak, and move on to something else. You know, because sometimes living in, actually, as human beings, we're living in limitation. But living within the field of limitations, it's um, showing us how strong we are, right? It's like we play these games like uh, escape room. Like, why would you put yourself in escape room? Well, to see how you can get out of it. Like, <laughs> well, why do it in the first place? Well, to see how clever I can be. Well, so you limit yourself in a room with uh, five or six people, and then you work uh, together to try to get out of it. That's It's fun. So when you start looking at the world which we're in, it's fun. But if you look at it and like, I don't like this, well, most likely you don't like it because you've been here too long in the state in which you're in. And you can elevate above. You'll still be able to know that that other rock station is still there when you turn into country or vice versa. It doesn't matter. But I am preferring new music. So a preference is more of I want to explore a different theme. It's not better. It's not worse. You know, obviously we get when we get into more congruent stuff, it's actually... It keeps amplifying. A lot of the negative stuff we experience um, breaks down quicker um, than anything. So that's kind of so most people know what they prefer when it comes to a certain way of living, and why they're not doing it is because they don't have the they don't think it's they're waiting for someone else to change rather than them changing. I like what you said about like how um, it's um, uh, like you wanting to change the frequency. It's essentially you kind of being tired of playing that that character mm. you know that's the feeling of like kind of being pulled down or you know whatnot and a lot of us think that um we have to this is like the 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 fill in the sack over your shoulder you we have to like carry these old experiences from when we were a child or when we were you know younger whatever you know high school college whatever we we have to carry these with us because those are who we are and it's like us throwing the rock station the classical station, everything while we're trying to, you know, tune to the, you know, country station or whatever. We don't need to hold on to these different stories. We don't need to hold on to these different ideas and and get from one station to the other. It can be instantaneous and it's through letting go. And it's um yeah. Y- you know, like uh so many of us think that our stories like th- we have to like um mold them together you know in in order to create something that we we can't just start fresh or have a you know uh a new path a new focus um it has to we have to bring our stories with us and and that's where we're getting caught in the mud that's where we're getting stuck is we're we're trying well this doesn't work because this happened to me when i was a kid and this won't work because i'm not that type of person i'm this type of person and it's all these different stories and ideas that are stopping us from becoming what we are because we say, Oh, that's who I am. But you're labeling who you are. Uh, you're, you're, you're writing a story or you're giving credence to something that you you're saying you are, you're none of that. You're whatever you say you are. And so in that same moment where you're saying, I can't do this because I'm not that type of person, that type of person only exists because you hold on to it. Yeah, exactly. And even like every moment of, telling yourself this is who I am, it's a completely new start because it's a new day. So even over time, if you still hold on to a negative belief onto something, even when you um, face that negative belief, it's different. You're a different human being. So understand that, that you're always shifting and changing. It has nothing to do with will. Will has nothing to do with shifting and changing. Will might be the ability to change in a different direction in which you've been going. 
But change is constant. That's the only constant. I mean, it's the one thing that is constant is change. So we don't have to work on change. But what would you prefer? And a lot of times it is stepping into the unknown to do that. That's the childlike state that we're all searching for. Because with children, we didn't know enough to hold on to anything. You know, you had a new friend every day or maybe whatever. But like, I'm like, oh, I can't be friends with you because I got that friend. That's just a weird thing to a child. They wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. You know, whether we're on the swing or the um, slide or the or the seesaw, it didn't matter. Yeah. They we, weren't labeling it. Yeah. We do this weird thing where we say to ourselves, like, oh, I can't be friends with this person because of this reason. You know, this this develops in later age because the story doesn't make sense that way. Oh, they're a football player. I'm I'm not a foot I'm not a jock. I'm this. You know? And so we we were like, I can I can no longer associate with this because it's not in line with the story that I repeat to myself every day. It's the attachment to the outside world. So you you got your joy be prior to the swing. You got your joy prior to making the friend. Like that's who you are. You're happy. Your joy. <clears throat> and then in that state to um, express it, all of a sudden you f you find the friend. You um, you get on the swing or what have you. That's an expression. And the expressions just perpetuate that feeling. Then it moves you on to another thing. But all of a sudden we got older. We labeled. Oh, I was happy because I was on the swing. Well, then you go back to swing and it's like oh, it's not doing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's not doing it. Like I have to do the roller coaster now. And then one day you'll be jumping off the top of buildings. Um, and there's nothing wrong with doing all that stuff, but that's not where the joy and happiness came from. That was the expression of your joy, the expression of your happiness. So we often go out into the outside world and say that's the reason. But just like when I look in the mirror, if I change my hair, it wasn't the mirror who changed my hair. The, I had to change my hair, and then the reflection came back, changed. So... If you're sitting, staring at the mirror, waiting for your hair to change, good luck. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Well, that's where 99% of us are. Yeah. And it, yeah, a lot of us, I spent a lot of my life there trying to change the outside world. And in, in the mix of giving up on changing the outside world, that's when my greatest changes happened. But I didn't realize that until later on when I started um, doing self inquiry. I'm like, why are these changes happening? Because you get so tired of holding on. Everyone does this, and you let go. And in the actual letting go, that's, that's, things start to happen. Yep. But if you don't, if you didn't know the mechanics or the formula, you wouldn't know that. So now, my success become um, by accident. <laughs> now my that's a good failures word. become by accident. Now, and I even learn from them too. So there's no such thing as a bad failure. I'm like, oh, that didn't work. Well, now I know that. You mm. know, mm -hmm. and it's how I label it. Um, now, I could label something in um, no matter what happens positively, and you have the 100% right to label it negatively, but the way you actually perceive it will actually give you the output in which you want to feel, and that's what we all want to feel, what we call good or happy. You know, So that's why if you look at the news the way I said, you know, where it's just showing you as what's, what's not prevalent on this planet, it, it gives a better feel to it. I think a lot of it is the way we're taught that this is how certain things are perceived. Like we're, we're taught from a very early age that things are perceived a certain way and everybody feels that way about them. And that's just not true. Yeah. Like we're taught that when this happens, everybody's going to feel this way and this is normal and this is how you should feel. And that's what we grow up with. And, is a lot of being told that. And we buy oh, into it. Oh, that's just normal. Yeah, and when we buy into it, it actually becomes true. Yeah, absolutely. That's everyone what's that watched, strengthening yeah, this yeah. whole, like he said in the video, yeah. this collective consciousness. See, your, your police structure will support everything in the field of it. I, I think we have a clip where he talks about that. Um, but, but yeah, if you have a belief that you go into hell in a handbag, you're going to experience what what a hell in a handbag is. I don't even know where that came from. Mm -hmm. I don't even carry a handbag. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I mean, I'll stay away from hell. <laughs> but like, I, I, it's, it's again, we, we, our entire lives have been handed a narrative and told what to believe, whether that's by a parent, whether that's by a sibling, whether that's by a friend, whether that's by social, or not social media, well, yeah, social media, but I mean like regular media, movie, film, et cetera. When something like this happens, this is a normal reaction. If you don't react that way, it is not. It is abnormal. That's what we've been taught. And yeah. so to not be destroyed by failing is considered abnormal. And so our lives, we have been taught that we have to crumble if we fall. And we, you know, and we have to feel a certain way because yeah. this is how everybody feels. And 
again, we're an ape species, you know, we're, or we're very similar to an ape species. And it's all about... Uh, well, the, the human um, part of us, but we're beyond that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I just mean like... Um, we're the, sentient beings. The, the very, yeah. the very, we're very similar in the sense of like we have like mob mentality, you know. Um, uh, yeah, but that's a belief. We want everybody yeah. to feel a certain way, etc. Yeah. So these are tendencies that you, you see, you know, throughout our... Uh, human race and so we we don't want to be different so when that situation happens i have to feel bad and so we have to get over these programs that have been handed to us our entire lives that when something doesn't go your way um or when you don't achieve something and you fail you must feel bad you must feel this sense of loss you must feel this sense of not worthy because this is what we've seen our whole lives in television movies you know by our parents or friends, etc. But we don't have to react this way. And this is why it feels funky and weird at first to not react that way. Is we're so used to a certain way that we have been taught to act and um uh, and we've normalized uh, something that is not normal. Yeah. Well, it, it's normal is just normal is a very interesting word. It's just not uh natural. Yeah, natural is a better word. Yeah. So I almost, and the way I put a positive spin on it, it's like I say this a lot. I says it feels like I'm in a long episode of Punked, <laughs> and Ashton Kutch is going to come out of the uh, bushes any moment now, and that would make a lot more sense to what's going on than what was actually going on. So once you become aware of it, it's don't blame your parents, don't blame uh, your schools, don't blame society. It's almost like they're waking us up to it, mm -hmm. because. Who knows if they were taught this outright, would we really experience it or would we, because um, I, I meet a lot of people too that are um, pseudo understanding. And I and listen, I used to be that way. I used to intellectualize and could talk about it, but I never felt it. I, I, I didn't feel it on the regular, I should say. Mm -hmm. I would fall into it, but then I could talk about it, good, good talk, but when I was done talking, I didn't feel good because I felt like I was lying to myself. But once I came into this... Uh, framework of actually feeling it with well, the way I explain it, it's a lot different um, and I realize it is possible it's actually available to every one of us at all times at all times and, and it's never left it's always around us no it's always been there you know everyone knows what it's like to feel good hey you couldn't know what it's like to be depressed if you weren't depressed because if you were always forever depressed you wouldn't notice it mm -hmm. just you wouldn't that would be the normal yeah, state be normal. so we fluctuate it's just we notice depression because it's not natural uh, opposed to noticing joy, and then sometimes when you notice your joy, if you're the, um, if you're in there in a more default um, setting, or I should say by accident, um, you might be waiting for the other shoe to drop, as they say, and you'll take that moment of joy and squander it. So that's you know I've experienced that myself when good things happen. I'm like, oh, this ain't gonna last. Right when I noticed that, <laughs> it it started to diffuse, and then you went back to this what they call like a baseline state well now when i understand that my baseline keeps moving and i don't know to what um elevation it will get i'm not looking for that anymore i'm just in it for the experience and that's it and then all of a sudden it presents itself through experiences like wow this is very interesting so when we like live in society and we're taught like uh, this is how a man acts this is how a um a lady acts we're handed these different ideas since birth okay so Here's your here's your race, here's your religion, um, here's your identity. Now get out there and do everything you can to protect that. <laughs> is essentially what we're what we're what we grow up with. Yeah, is we're handed a set of beliefs. The, you know, you are a um, you are a Catholic. You know, you went to Catholic school. You have this. You know, you're a man. You're growing up in this environment. You're from this state. All of these different things are things that we did not choose. They were beliefs that were shared onto us, not things that we, you know, um, consciously, you know, were like, oh, I want to do this or I want to be that. And we, we don't even r realize it, but we go around each day defending these ideas because to us, that's what we consider real. And so that's why as you begin to work through a lot of these, you feel like, um, or a lot of people are afraid to work through things like this because that's all they have ever known. That's all they've ever associated with. That is their full identity. But what we're really all craving is 
freedom from that because that's the weight that's been on our shoulders our whole life, which is living up to this idea that was handed to us. Yeah, and we're letting go. And more and more people on the planet. So the ideas of what a man and woman has been changing since I was in high school. So oh, absolutely. That's, it's been a long time coming. And now, um, you know, some people are holding on to that. But, uh, you know. I think that's the reason where people are waking up right now in, in droves and why we're seeing so much more of this material out there and why we're seeing, you know, um, the extraterrestrial stuff in the news, et cetera. Yeah. People are finally um, coming into their own. Hey, I can... You know, yeah, but have hi- my beliefs. But historically, people have always been waking up. We have to think it. Mm-hmm. Which is this an elevation? Because you know, is this an elevation to another prominent wake up? Because even from here, there's multitudes of levels that we aren't aware of yet. So, like you know, um, obviously, when you came into industrial revolution, people were waking up to uh, certain things, and you know, certain things worked really well, and certain things didn't. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? So, okay, we wake up, okay, this didn't work, let's switch to that. But the Industrial Revolution got us, and I'm just using a little fragment of human existence in space and time. We've always been waking up, but don't pretend that you know everything, because that can get you in trouble. That could become, because once I hold on to knowing everything, I fall short of learning and elevating higher. So if I think I'm at the top story of, uh, or the top frequency in the world, I'm like, yeah, now I'm going to, I'm probably in the basement. Well, and why do we do that? You know, Bashar talks about this too. I don't have a clip on it, but um, he, he talks about this all the time, which is we try to control things. We try to dominate them simply to feel in control. Yeah. Like we, that's, that's the reason we try to, you know, have this structure, have this, et cetera, is we're trying so desperately to feel like we're in control. Never in our lives have we been taught that it's okay to float. It's okay to that is, go with the flow down the stream. That is the ultimate control is allowing. Mm-hmm. So letting going, allowing uh, the stream is already flowing that way. There's nothing you have to do with it. Like these, that was the hardest thing for me was to learn that, which was I was trying to control and manipulate everything so I could have the outcome that I desired, rather than saying, "Okay, I'm going to let go of this and roll with it," yeah. and be bewildered uh you know elated with the you know the great things and the surprises that come with life but we're, we're taught that we need to, to manage everything and we don't need to manage everything in fact the, the trying that, nice. to manage is what's throwing it off yeah it's almost like anyone that's ever been in the water for a period of time to see at the ocean there's a thing called a riptide and if you're trying to swim against the riptide that's when you drown but if you allow it to pull you out to where um where it comes to its fruition and then you f- uh, swim either direction parallel to the shore, all of a sudden the next set of waves will pull you in with less effort. Yes, it seems counterproductive when you get pulled out. But if you try to swim against, that's where you tire out and you drown. But understanding um, that you can float, especially in salt water, and you get pulled out, you know, get into a float state, get your head up, and then once, once you feel the riptide um, stop pulling you out, then swim in a parallel direction to the shoreline and then start swimming in and the waves will help you pull in. You don't need to effort yourself as much as you think. And that is a natural law. So that's why it seems counter, counter um, productive, but it's not. Um, it's actually counterintuitive to actually allow the world, let the water help you, don't fight it. Because good luck fighting the water. Well, I can't remember who told me, but I heard that story about Navy SEALs one time. And one of their their things, one of their training missions, if you will, is they get dropped into this random river. And it's a moving stream, etc. And the point of the challenge is to see who is going to fight uh, against it and try to, you know, swim upstream or swim to get out, etc. And those who simply float. And the, the, the point of the exercise is you need to float and allow yourself to, to bring you to the next point, et cetera. And I thought that was so interesting because that's exactly what life is. You yeah. know, we think we got to get in here and fight it out and duke it out, but we don't, we need, we need to learn how to float. Yeah. And the point I also want to make is Mike brought this up. It's really good is a lot of people like when they hear this, okay, that's easier said than done. But when I was a kid, I was shown in a riptide how to, so I actually experienced it. So therefore having the experience gave me a great faith. So uh, of an understanding, actually, I had to have faith for my dad to put me in that situation. But then once I experience it, it's no longer faith, it's a knowing. So that's what happens in life. You have to have faith that it's going to work out. 
So then you get into the situation, you watch it work out. Now you know it's going to work out, but every situation anew creates another elevation of faith. So we're not like so. Whenever you're ta- trying to stuff out, do it to your own pace. Because Bashar will say this: Do not dishonor your beliefs. You just want to expand them and or slowly let go parts of these belief structures. Maybe get rid of the whole belief, but you do it on your own because you can get hurt that way. So that's that's what we're seeing here. We're trying to encourage. I always encourage myself to slowly let go, um, to head into something new, and I have to let go, or else I'm just stuck you know, at the side of the river, so to speak. But once I let go and watch it pull me, it's, it becomes exciting. Oh, now the rapids are getting heavier. Oh my God, I have to come into another faith because when the rapids were at a two, it was easier. Now they're at a three. I'm like, well, it's the same. It's just a higher frequency of wave movement. But now you have to really let go a little bit more and a little bit more. And I'm using this as a metaphor. I'm not saying you have to get on a river and do this. (laughs) But, um, it's helping us uh, let go of old wanted beliefs, but you shouldn't, like, um, I'm going to use, um, Mark Twain uses for addictions. I'm going to use it for beliefs. You ought not to toss your beliefs out the window, but coax them down the steps one step at a time. And when you do that, you'll come to realize this belief is no longer working for me. But don't dishonor it by throwing it out the window because you'll get in trouble. And that's what we don't want. So I want you to step into this belief and see, okay, what part of this belief... Am I still learning from what part of my belief am I holding on because I don't know anything else? But if I don't let go, like the monkey bar theory, I can't get to the next bar. So focus on what you're grabbing on. This is how we slowly let go of our beliefs. And we all, every human being had beliefs years ago. And you look back, you no longer have those beliefs. At some point, you let go of them to what we call advance in the direction which you're in. So why are we having to struggle with them now? Because we think this is who I am. I'm like, no, no. That belief structure got you here. It was the modality in which, you know, it was like the car that got you to the airport. But if you don't get out of the car, you're not getting on the plane. Nope. Yeah, so. I said we dive into our next clip. All right, here we go. As the ego feels it's going to lose out, it will try to hold off in your own consciousness. As soon as the ego feels it's going to lose out, it will try to hold on to anything that it can. And it will constrict the flow of energy. So it's all about really letting it know you unconditionally love it. You thank it for the job that it's doing, that it was designed to do. And it's going to benefit greatly by working in partnership with the higher mind as well. And that is going to take the weight off its shoulders so it doesn't have to be quite so tired. Right. Or it feels like it's being um, not acknowledged yes. at times and yes. to say it's done the- always thank the ego for the perspective it has given you because it is doing its job at least the best that it knows how to do with the belief systems that all of you have fed it okay. but it is doing its job everything that is being done in that way is being done out of love to the best of its ability if it simply has come up short then it's only because it is working with limited tools or limited belief systems so you can discuss with the ego have this dialogue with yourself about other ways other perspectives other tools it can use so that you always know you're letting it know what's going on it's never being left out of the conversation you're always keeping the ego in the loop okay Make sense? Makes sense. So you work together as a partnership. You can make an agreement with it. In fact, again, along the lines of always acting these things out as best as you possibly can, sit down, literally, physically, sit down and write out, literally write out a contract between you and your ego. Hmm, And state therein what the job is, just like in any contract. This is your responsibility. This is my responsibility. We agree to this. We agree to that. Sign here. Done deal. (laughs) Anytime you physicalize things like that, because you are all so used to the concept that physical reality is solid and real, anytime you actually physicalize something like that, you will make it seem more real to you than just keeping it in your head. Get it out physically in front of you so you will have a piece of paper. And anytime the ego acts up, ooh, 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 contract. (laughs) Looky, looky, you agreed. Because it's to your benefit. Remember, rattle, rattle, rattle the mm-hmm. paper. I love that. I know. That's one of my favorite clips because um, especially nowadays, we're uh, with the new thought movement and different stuff. People are talking about, you know, you got to get rid of this ego. You got to kill your ego, this ego death, all this. But the ego has a purpose. And the, the ego is, is sur- it has a purpose here in the this third dimensional reality in this earth that or the, yeah in this on this planet Earth that we you know experience, mm-hmm. and um, 
it, the way Bashar describes it here is awesome because the ego is our belief system. It is our identity. And so when we can kind of um, uh, capture that, and experience that it's easier for us to disconnect with it or recognize it when it comes up and put space between it and detach from it and say, Oh, that's what the ego is, you know? And, uh, that's not who I am, <laughs> you know, that's not uh, the essence of my soul. And so I love this clip because, um, I don't know, too often we're taught that the, the ego is this horrible thing that we have to absolutely get rid of. And it's like, no, we need to uh, befriend the ego and realize, hmm, okay, this is the purpose you serve on this planet that we call Earth, this three-dimensional school, if you will. And I'm going to learn to work with you, you know, uh, in tandem, not against you. Yeah. And the ego would be um, a character to an actor. So, like, the ego That's perfect. of... Um, of um what's his name tom yeah. hanks would one ego would be forrest gump yep but he's not attached to it but yet he he immerses himself in that for the role but then he detached like i'm not sure if he's a method actor i don't know he may be but to say he isn't and say every night he left the, the set he went back to being tom hanks and then came back to set he went back into forrest gump so that's kind of what we're doing and in the in the slight space or detachment from it is where he could develop the character even better if you get too immersed in it then you're actually coming from your uh, getting lost in it, and that could um, hinder the experience as well. So it's just knowing that you're detached from it. And I like, I like what he said about writing it down, because they've actually proven this. When you actually write stuff down or express it outward, whether it's writing it down on paper or expressing it through music or um, you know, painting or any, you know, even an accountant writing numbers down, it actually gets it out of your head. It's, the, uh, it's, it's tied to the geometric shaping of the brain. So it actually puts it, and create separation from it. So when you're writing, I notice when I write stuff down, um, if I'm writing stuff down that um, is no longer work for me, as I'm writing it down, I could see somewhat the ridiculousness in it, and it gives me that separation. Mm -hmm. So, and also too, if you do a contract with yourself, make sure you get a lawyer that really holds you to it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. another way that I also look at ego too is the roles that I play, and so I always that's something that I really you know, on my journey realized is like, okay, so I'm a, I'm a son, I'm a brother, you know, I'm a business owner, I'm a team leader, I'm this, I'm that. These are all different roles that we play. You're a father, you're a mother, you're this, you're that, you're a friend, you're, you're a foe, whatever. These are all different parts of our ego. And we need to see them because Without, without one, you, you can't have the other. Just like a hero needs a villain, you know, it's very similar, like in the situations that we have and experience here on Earth. So that person that you think is your arch enemy or, you know, that you can't absolutely stand, you should be thanking them because that's, that is some soul friend of yours that you have this cosmic connection with. And... You know, once this life passes, you know, and we go up and we, ex you know, experience wholeness again, we, um, y you're going to see that, you know, that soul friend of yours. Oh my God, can you believe how great of a job I did playing that, you know, the villain, yeah. you know, did you see how angry and upset you got, except like, these are the ways we need to view these experiences. Not if you're getting triggered or you're getting this reaction, et cetera, from something that that is something inside of you that needs to be, um, recognized and that's something that you want to um, dive deeper into why am i getting such a pull why am i getting so angry why am i getting so emotionally you know um pulled to this you know situation that's where deep rooted learning you know can be found yeah exactly it's about detaching from it because you know it, when a movie say like uh batman or whatever and mm -hmm. you have uh like say christian bale playing batman i think uh, bane was played by um tom hardy in that series i believe um, you know, they were both um, both celebrated as acting out, even though in the play, in the movie of Batman, everyone wants Batman to succeed. But nonetheless, the tenacity of uh, Bane's acting, or I should say Tom Hardy's acting ability to actually really put on the, for the forefront Bane's um, scary ability to maybe overcome Batman is why we watch it. And so right now we're playing in these themes of good and bad, and but there are other themes out there beyond that. As we start slowly let, letting go of the ego, we'll come into these other themes. But right now we're playing in this theme because it's 
it's a theme of um you know uh it's a diff- hero's journey yeah it's a hero's journey it's difficult to get through but hey this is why we're here right we're here to know how powerful we are but place ourselves in uh, a, f- a field of limitation like why would an why would an individual join the navy seals <laughs> They want to see how powerful they are, right? And I'm just using them as an example because when it comes to physical and mental, um, it's pretty elite to do that. Why would you put yourself through that? To see how they would do, like to see how strong they were, push themselves. And when they do that, it seems to, they seem to rise above something. And now, wow, well, from this moment on, nothing can really take me down. It's really cool that you said that. I've never thought of it that way, but you're totally right. That's just a theme that's present right now. You know, yeah. this hero's journey, this good versus evil, they're the, you know, we're going to have different themes that we can't even fathom or think of right now begin to, you well, know, we, appear in yeah. c- civilization. That theme seems to be strong, but there like there's other movies out there that don't have that necessarily theme, you know. Mm-hmm. Um you start this, and it's it's not that we should ever do away with anything. I'm like, it's not about that. That's the ego saying, "Oh, we should get into this theme. Stop playing those movies." I'm like, let let people alone. Mm-hmm. If you watch a horror movie or comedy, who cares? You're learning something from it. it's entertainment. All right. Now, if it's messing up your day, you know, you might want to suggest to the person, "Hey, why don't you try a comedy?" You know, well, comedies can mess up people's day too, right? Mm-hmm. Is they're all walking around just being the prankster all day at work. Mm-hmm. I get accused of that. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you know, that's when it comes to the individual shifting into the place where they want to be. Stop waiting for somebody else to do it, kind of like Bashar said in uh, the first clip. Um, become that change. Change to that frequency. Leave everyone else where they're at. They're learning something. Because when I was in the mud, I learned how to get out of the mud. Yeah. So now it's like if I see mud again, I'm not scared of mud. I still walk around it. I don't go through it. But if I fell in it, I wouldn't freak out because I know how to get out of mud. And how real the mud feels. That's something that I remember. Yeah. Because, that, you know, you talk to people and they're just in a, a bad place or, you know, they're they're struggling. And to minimize that or pretend that that doesn't feel real doesn't help. Yeah. And that's not what we're here to do. We're here to show you that, yeah, that that's painful shit you're going through. Yeah, that that is not something I would deem preferential. But why why are they feeling bad in that situation? Beyond that, think about that. Yeah. Why are they feeling bad in that situation? I ought not to be here is what the ego's saying. They're fighting it. Correct. So just like in the riptide, if you fight the riptide, you will drown, mm-hmm. or at least not come to complete exhaustion where somebody else has to save you. So is the riptide? A non-preferential place you know some surfers mo- love riptides because it pulls them out to the ocean far enough to where they don't have to paddle mm-hmm. but they know how to use it so if you know how to use it it's not non-preferential it's just how you're using it how you look at it so it's the fighting against everything that makes it non-preferential not the actual situation onto itself there is no inherent negative in anything other than the meaning we give it. And if we do, it will fight us or we fight against it and it will show us that it will exhaust the hell out of us. Yeah. yeah. The last thing I want to mention about this clip before we jump into the next one is at the end of this clip, he's talking about how uh, reality feels so real. And I thought this was great and I just want to touch on this, but scientifically, guys, like, you know, in our modern day science, we have proven that, you know, uh, this table that I'm sitting at with Frank right now you know, if I could move fast enough, I could put my hand through this table. These, This is nothing but vibrating particles, magnetism being pushed against, etc. So science has proven that the world we're, we're walking around in, there is no matter. There is no real matter. But that's how we experience it. And so when um, Bashar in this clip was talking about writing a contract to make it real, all right, you're experiencing this ego as real. So treat it as, as that, you know, put it on paper, you know, separate it, detach from it, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And I thought that was great because um, at the, the more that we can understand and realize that everything we're experiencing and, you know, in this reality is actually moving particles, vibrating frequency, particle, light, you know, et cetera, the less real and of a hold it has on us. And you can kind of uh, intellectually, intellectually and analytically, 
get yourself through it by realizing, hmm, okay, these are all vibrating particles. I understand what people mean when they say, you know, you're attracting certain experiences. You are bringing different wavelengths, light, frequency, et cetera, into, you know, uh, your sphere, if you will, you, you know, as you're experiencing life. And so, I don't know, I, I love that he mentioned that um, and talked about it so nonchalantly. Like, oh yeah, you know, this reality that you take so real, we do take it real. But when we can understand it, at least for me personally, from an analytical and intellectual way of, hey, this is all vibrating particles around me, it makes it easier to step into these types of concepts. Yeah, and also too, you know, understand that it, everything is going on inside. So the reality is the sensations in what we call our body that we're experiencing. Yeah. So there really isn't anything outside of us. Um, it's just the illusion, like the reflection on the mirror. If I looked in the, you know, if I looked in the water and see a reflection, that's there, that reflection. That reflection has no tangible aspect of it at all. Mm -hmm. So everything outside is is a reflection of the electromagnetic field in which we're in. But the ego, what, what I've noticed in myself when I actually started letting go, the ego actually likes to be told what to do. So once we start letting go, the ego loves to take orders rather than giving orders. When it gives orders, it doesn't work out well. So that's kind of what it is. It's like putting the cart in front of the horse is kind of using the ego to get around. But when you put the horse in front of the cart, the cart likes it so much better. It just pulls along and then it can have the experience a lot easier, a lot better. Because ego is just a recording system in our, for our subconscious. But if you keep reiterating and going back, like, okay, this is what we did yesterday, let's do it again because it felt good. I'm like, yeah, it's not going to help me today. But the ego needs to take the back seat. And when it does, the ego actually likes it. You don't have to keep fighting it. Once the ego's in the back seat reading a newspaper, it loves to be driven around. Mm -hmm. It really does. So when you start to experience that, it actually helps you internally as well. Great point. Yeah. Let's jump into our third clip. All right, here we go. Hi, Bashar. I know you a good day. Um, I don't really know that I have a question. I would like clarification. About? Um, once, uh, <laughs> my life situation. Uh, once upon a time when I was younger, um, when I wanted to move somewhere such as Hawaii and Australia and Papua New Guinea, I just got up and moved without fear and without any thought of consequences. And, and sense now? Of, and now I'm older and I want to move back to California and... How old are you? 65. What a baby. <laughs> <laughs> what a young whippersnapper. <laughs> okay, so I'm just saying... I am 178. I <laughs> so what is preventing you from moving where you say you prefer to be? My issue with many, which... I My always issue had that. with money. I, yeah, I don't have the money. I don't have the desire to move and take risks and just do it and not know what happens like I used to. All right, then I, don't. I know, and that's what I'm doing. And You have to honor your belief system. If you don't believe your excitement will support you. But all that means is you don't understand what it means when excitement is complete kit. But that's all right. Okay, so that's it? You have to honor your belief system. Obviously, you're saying you don't prefer to. So let's examine it step by step. What specifically now looks like a risk that didn't look that way before? And what's the difference between now and then? The stories in my head about California is expensive and I can't find a job and can't support myself and... What changed? I didn't think about those things before. That wasn't even an issue. Then why are you thinking about them now? That's a good question. I don't Thank know. Thank you. Oh, I know you do. You have a good answer in there somewhere. What changed? What changed? Oh, I'd like to cop out and say life experience, but... All right. Well, it's all right. You can say, well, I picked up some ideas along the way. Okay. They may not necessarily be in alignment with who I prefer to be, but I picked up some ideas. Okay. I'll, I'll go with that. All right. But if you know that you don't prefer them, why hold on to them? How do they serve you? Um, they don't serve me. I, I, I'm, well, I'm they saying, obviously must in your mind or you wouldn't have them. I'm choosing, Remember when we yeah. talked about the motivational mechanism? Yeah. You don't hold on to anything you don't believe serves you, even if it's negative. So how does holding on to these things serve you? 
What does it prevent you from doing so that you don't go somewhere scary? How are you defining something as scary that you didn't used to define that way? What changed? Why did your definitions change? I, I'm hearing inside my head that I've just chosen to be comfortable. Comfortable, and, and, all right. And that's kind of a cop-out. Well, all right, if you define comfort as a cop-out, although you don't have to. Okay. Oh, I see. You're thinking that because you go through different cycles in life, that something is wrong? That it's not okay to suddenly be different and do things in a different way? It's not okay to be comfortable and take a break? And if you're not doing things the way you used to, then somehow you're not living up to your full potential? Bingo. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, you know that that is really nonsense. Mm -hmm. So why buy into that? Bingo. You can go through different phases. You can do things differently. Yeah. It's all right if you do them differently than before. As long as they're in alignment with who you prefer to be, that's okay. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm getting the judgment in being comfortable and not being the doer all the time. It's similar to the idea on your planet that when people experience depression, they're defining their experience in a negative way and so experiencing it as depression when in fact all it really is is the natural compression that happens when you know you're looking for answers that can't be found out there. So you go to where you know they are, within. And you reevaluate yourself and you redefine yourself and you emerge as a new person, literally. But if you define the idea of going within that way to look for answers as something antisocial, something's wrong with you, you're not outgoing anymore, you're withdrawn, if you start defining that idea in a negative way, even though it's a natural mechanism, you will start to experience the negative effects of defining it that way. And it turns into depression instead of compression. Thank you. So this is similar. This is why we say it is so absolutely crucial to pay attention to how you define things. Listen to your definitions. Really pay attention to what's going on when you have an experience. Catch yourself. Catch yourself when you label something negatively. I love how we redefined or um, depression. <laughs> Because again, like people know what that feels like, but when you define it as bad, you actually experience it as bad. Rather than depression, it's compression, going within to experience something new. Like you're at the end of the road, like this, the end of the story is about to change. And that's usually when people get depressed. Mm -hmm. When something in their life, like a, a job came to an end or you know, they're at a certain Relationship age. Relationship came yeah, to an end. Yeah, all these things. It could be anything, you know, Whatever. comes to an end. That's the time where it's like, okay, you know, as an actor, my job's over. Okay, what am I going to become next? Let me call my agent. Let's see. You know, you go within, so to speak. But if you label that as, like, I like that high feeling of moving, what they call the acceleration feeling. Well, you can't keep, keep accelerating because you'll burn out, so to speak. So there is these ebb and flows. But when you get down into the um, that lower part, all of a sudden you label it as bad, and that's what we call depression. And it really is a de definition. And people, if you buy into definition, yes, you're experiencing it doesn't feel good. But when you actually alter the, the definition, yeah, am I as um, high energy as I was uh, yesterday? No, but who cares? It doesn't matter. Now I'm in a very meditative state, very relaxed. Nice. I think what I thought, so when I, I watched this clip, with I love watching Bashar interact with the audience. And I mentioned this earlier in this episode, but the the experience that this woman is having, you know, is very, quote unquote, normal in, in how we've been all taught to believe, you know, of course, you know, you're 65 years old, you're moving to a state that's expensive, you don't have work lined up, like at the end of the day, how do you how do you expect this to just work out? These are all very heavily um, normalized and agreed upon things in a society like yeah i would be worried too etc and bashar's taking the exact opposite approach of that yeah. you know okay yeah sure you know and did you notice the woman's body language when he put her into a different definition? oh she became so she, much more, she more relaxed yeah she changed it was beautiful yeah. and, and this feeling that that you just pointed out is what we're all looking for this sense of relief like 
Like I always knew this. I just my whole life I've been told this is how I need to think. Yeah. I'm supposed to feel this way. I'm supposed to feel unsure. Why? Because I don't know what job I'm going to do. Why? Because I, I'm getting older, you know, and I don't know who's going to take care of me. Um, California's expensive. Who's going to argue that? These are all things that we have, again, we are taught and in, in repeatedly in and out that it is normal to feel negative, to feel low vibrational. Well, and we're the, taught that that is, that is correct, yeah. that that is a right experience. And so I just want to point that out, that that's what Bashar is doing, is helping people to see, see that this is not the way you're supposed to feel. Yes, you've been taught this. Yes, we've um, uh, all shared this belief at times, or we've all shared an experience similar to this at times, but this does not mean it's the end-all, be-all. And that's the hope and glimmer that each person getting up speaking to Bashar is looking for, which is they think their situation is so different from everyone else's, even though we're all going through the same experiences, just in our own different version and details. Yeah. And I want to clarify, um, cause when he talked about, like when he changed the definition of depression to compression, the state or the feeling, um, is the same. It's just the way you look at it gives you a different outlook. Because what I'm saying is, like when I go to the gym, I want to, you know, working out. Some workouts, I, I'm like, I'm high amplitude. I'm like energized. Some aren't. But I've never had a bad workout because I define it that way. But if you, I, I want to dismiss, I don't want people to mis, be misled by this. Just because I changed the definition doesn't make you not cozy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make you want to run um, a marathon. It doesn't do that. You're still going to have that feeling. Because whenever anyone sets into depression, it's like, oh, it's relaxed feeling. But then they're like, I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I'm depressed. Oh, my God. That's what always happens. But no, it's the end of the night, so to speak. The end of the cycle of a day, you're getting ready to go down. Now, at nighttime, we allow that feeling to happen because we part, we realize, oh, I'm getting ready to go to bed. But when we, we have that feeling one morning, we wake up like something's wrong with me. I'm like, no, it's a cycle question go in maybe something's happening maybe something's about to anew itself and so i want people to know that you're not always supposed to feel this high energy exhilarating feeling you can feel cozy and relaxed and still be in a high amplitude of energy so don't get the two mixed up because if you know you're feeling low like i shouldn't be feeling low because i redefined it but i still feel low i'm like no you just you're not you're not accelerating like the rpms of my car don't need to be at 5,000 miles, a 5,000 RPMs all the time. So I don't want them to be because the engine will blow. But I sometimes get to another place. I need uh, to a quicker rate in my car. I, I'll step on the gas. They'll go up to about 5,000. But once I'm at the speed I want to travel at, they actually go back down to about 2,000. Mm-hmm. But when it goes back to 2,000, I'm actually at the speed that I was faster than I was when I started uh, generating more torque in my car. So just keep that in mind that don't don't get those two mixed up because everyone thinks the acceleration part is where we're supposed to always be. And I'm like, no, no, you'd burn out if you would. Yeah, you're right about that. That is the uh, common misconception that we always have to be so high and that, it, you know, it's it's actually in the low moments that. Well, that's where you contemplate. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but also it's where you get the momentum. But I, I don't know. So now when I look at situations when I feel like um, I'm, you know, um, down, if you will, or in a lower vibrational state, and I look at it for what it is, which is, hey, this is this is like the climbing up the hill, you know, moment. Yeah. And it's just on the other side of this that, again, you know, and, the and, tide will change. The, yeah. the uh, pendulum swings. I know that it's not necessarily a lower vibration, but if I'm doing f- uh, 500 RPM, 5,000 RPM, sorry, and I'm starting out, say I'm like a, at zero point and I get up to 100 miles an hour all of a sudden the RPMs drop but I'm still at 100 miles an hour I didn't drop to a different level that's the mistake that's what I'm talking about that's what you're when saying. you're comfortable I'm still doing 100 miles an hour but now I don't need uh, 5,000 RPMs I only need two to ma- maintain it and sustain it that's what I'm talking about you're actually it's not that you're a lower vibration you're actually more effortlessly at a higher vibration so you don't feel the the tug or the pull or the resistance as much when you get there. So don't mistake that you're at a lower level. You're not. You're at a higher level. It's we're more efficient the higher we get. That's that's kind of how I want to 
place it, but it's going to feel more relaxed. You know, if I'm getting on the freeway in my car, I don't want to drink a drink. But once I'm at 100 miles an hour, I can mess around. I can put the coffee, you know, on my dashboard if I want because it's steady. Mm-hmm. So that's the time where, ah, this is where I want to be, you know. And then, oh, I want to go faster. Or I want to downgrade and go here and go there. So then all of a sudden the altitude changes and you feel that tug. You feel that pull. Sometimes we get addicted to that. But you're used to it. You know, well, you're, you're aware of it is what I should say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the other thing too, I, I thought I had a clip with him saying this, but uh, there is a formula and he says this all the time. He's been saying it for 40 years and I love it. When it comes to living your life, and if you follow this formula as best you can, it's follow your joy as best you can, your highest excitement with zero insistence on how it's supposed to turn out or assumptions on how it's supposed to turn out. And maintain a positive attitude, like such as giving yourself positive definitions. Life will hand itself to you beautifully. Because we don't know. No one ever knew what was about to happen. Once it happened, they went back and they told the story of how it happened. They reverse engineered it, but that won't get them anywhere. This story will not get me to the next story. I need a whole new story. But this story could let me know. I can actually experience a whole nother story. So history tells us that, hey, we're choosing this. What, who, history show me, do I want to do something different? Yes, then change. So history has a purpose, has a point. But it's not to emulate or, or redo because that's boring. You know, how many times would you remake a movie? After a while, you know, unless you put more emphasis on how you tell the story, it's different then. But you want to move on to a different story. And that's kind of, so follow your passion as far as you can with zero insistence on the outcome or how it's supposed to outcome and even let go of the outcome. You'll live an amazing life because what you think might be the outcome, be a great outcome to the ego mind is the floor to where the higher mind, to with the higher mind, that's the floor. But to ego mind, they think it's the ceiling. (laughs) So we don't know because we only know what we know. And if you want to experience something even greater, that's why synchronicity starts to evolve. Or synchronicity is always here, but it starts to produce what we call excitement when we start getting to this higher level. So if you're experiencing synchronicity at a higher rate than you did before in what we call preferential experience, you're already there. You're just going to get more of it. So stop trying to get somewhere. If you're facing west, you're already there. Now you're just going to get more west, so to speak. And that's kind of the message Bashar is teaching us. Wherever you are, you're there. Just define it as that. But if you define it, you're not. You're always going to not be there. And that's the pull and tug on a psychological setting. We get so attached to it. Again, I must say this. like, No one's doing anything wrong other than they think they're doing something wrong. And if they think they're doing something wrong, they're going to experience they're doing something wrong. And it's going to present itself in the outside world. And this goes for the spiritual path as well. You know, the always seeking, always, you know, up. Oh, I just need to, that, that one next YouTube video, that one next book, that one next teacher, that they're going to teach me everything, yeah. or, you know, or it's just going to click. And then, Matt, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're there right now, right, right, right now. Right now, yeah. And, I, you know, I used to, I, I, was, I was huge at doing that. I would read books, uh, listen to people like Bashar all the time thinking it would get me a better place. Now when I read books and now when I listen to Bashar, it's for the experience period. That's all it is. It's like I just do everything for the experience. I'm not trying to get anything out of it. If I try to get something out of Bashar, I'm going to eventually hate Bashar. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, Same thing with books now. I read them just for the experience only. And by proxy or by just by natural causation, you get something out of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not looking for it. I don't know what to look to get out of it, you know? I, I better get this out of this book. And halfway through the book, I'm like, this book's shit. I'm like, why? I'm not well, getting It's not going it. the way I want. I'm like, I'm like you're not the author. <laughs> Allow the author to speak their mind and just go along with it. But I'm like, write your own book if you want that, if you want that to be. And anyone that's ever written a book knows that. You start out with an idea and you, it, you end up in a place that you never knew you were going to be. You know what just popped into my head when you were talking about this? So we live in this world, right, where we're 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 a consumer you know at least in western culture what i'm used to and grew up with where um 
everything is marketed at your always there's always an opportunity to you know sell something there's always an opportunity to do something so what we've kind of done is we've taken this ego mind that has constantly like complained oh this would be better if this was this way you know uh, this would be more efficient if this was this way and we have been strengthening our ego strengthening our belief system over and over especially like with the products that we're releasing and the idea of like customer service and the customer is always right and all of these different things we have only been strengthening and strengthening these belief systems that aren't you know always the best thing for us or uh, going the direction we would much prefer to go so we're kind of constantly marketing and improving on different devices machinery uh, systems processes etc that just feed and make the ego feel better and that's what we've kind of developed is like this system where it's like oh somebody's not going to like this because of that we must come out with a version that has that capability Mm -hmm. and so we're just trying to feed and feed and feed these um, ideas or you know these beliefs or these, these systems that we've had and that's why we normalize things and that's why things are we we are considered normal um you know because other people must experience them this way or you know um this is why we're developing these devices or things or whatever you know products you know to help you overcome that is because that's a normal way to feel or we get you don't want to feel that way I don't know. I, that just kind of popped well, into my head, but that's something that's definitely been going on forever. We're yeah, just, but that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you don't experience the iPhone, but you don't need it. No, of course. So, like having all these things and understanding it, like uh, the you know, at some level, the customer is always right because if someone feels a certain way, you can't argue with them. But don't be attached to their rightness mm-hmm. or their righteousness, if you say. So, when you actually understand this, you elevate above it, but you still use it. Mm-hmm. You know, you could still use the iPhone for the experience. You, you go go to a Bashar um, retreat for the experience, but you try to get something out of it, trying to become better, you're going to mis- misappropriate you're gonna, uh, your time. You're going to misunderstand it too. But if you just do it for the mere experience, it's amazing what you get out of it. Let go of trying to get something. Just have the experience. That's why we're here. So we're not here to do away with the cell phone or shoes or clothing or money. Mm-mm. I want to experience it, but I'm not trying to get something out of it because I can't get something out of something that keeps moving. You know, it's constantly moving. The physical world is fleeting. So what can I get out of it other than the experience? That's all I'm here for. And, I, and once that experience goes, oh, another one. You never run out of experiences. Just like I'm never too full to have another meal a couple hours later mm-hmm. if that's what I want to experience. Oh, I'm too full to eat now. You are now, but eventually you won't be. This is constantly fleeting, constantly changing, because we came here to have multitudes of experiences. How we look at them will create an excellent life or a, or a demanding and stressful life. But it's not the outside world. It's how we're looking at it, how we perceive it, how we're defining it. And once you get better, or greater, I should say, at defining things in a more preferential feeling, the outside world, maybe to other people, don't change. You know, I could, I could talk to someone, like, people like, the world's going to hell. I'm like, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> now, I'm not righter than they are, but I feel better about my definition. I can tell you that. That's true. Because I used to be that way. I used to, you know, I'm from New York, for the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of just in your blood. How's it going? Don't ask. You know? <laughs> <laughs> don't ask. Yeah. So, but um, I got tired of that, that, um, program that belief yeah, yeah that uh, yeah that baseline or that yeah. uh, default like that was my default like the, go for the norm that you were handed this is yeah. how new yorkers act yeah and i just we were I fed got, this shit. yeah i got tired of it and again i'm just playing on new yorkers There's a lot of happy new yorkers out there no oh, of yeah, course exactly only five but you know. <laughs> <laughs> all five of them. Yeah, all five of those happy people no but seriously <laughs> again these are all just <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we we're, we're, that that is a group identity. It is how New Yorkers yeah. act. This yeah. is how people from blah 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 act. Like yeah. these are all things that we don't really consciously yeah. even think about. Yeah, you, in other words, you can have the most spiritual human being living in in uh, Manhattan in a four hundred square foot apartment. Absolutely, that's, that's the truth. You can. So I'm just using that as an example. So you New Yorkers out there, don't hate me. 
Because <laughs> I used to be one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Once a New Yorker, always a New yeah, Yorker. Yeah, that's what they tell me. In your blood, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Honestly, I um, I love Bashar. He has so much great content out there. Well, one thing uh, that was kind of interesting, Frank, touch on this before we wrap things up. What was he saying about, you know, his ship? So you've you've watched Bashar for what, 15, 20 years? Uh, yeah, at least. It's yeah, so more, yeah. I mean, so for 20 years, he, he's yeah, talked about even, this, yeah, even more than that, but yeah, but this yeah. entity that he's channeled, Bashar. And it's funny, you told me like, um, you know, years ago, he was talking about how, you know, far away or distant this um, entity Bashar was. And he's coming closer and closer and closer. All right, yeah, so for, right now, yeah, according to Bashar, his, his spaceship is right above Bell Rock, and that's in uh, Sedona, Arizona. Mm hmm. And um, it's about 25, again, last time I heard, I don't know what it is today. It's about 2,500. Um, 25,000 or 2,500? 20, I don't know, 25, I'm not sure, miles or whatever. Okay. Um, above, you know, Bell Rock. So obviously, since I've been listening to him for a very long time, it's it's been lowering. And the reason is, is because as he started out with the first clip we talked about, as our residents happen, uh, as it changes, will become a more susceptible or will have the ability to receive more of this information. Now, don't get, don't mistake this. We're already there. Why? Because if you're listening to Bashar and you like Bashar, it means you're in resonance with an extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. You already are. This is just one form of resonance. They don't need to pop in front of you with uh, their big uh, almond-shaped eyes, I guess. I don't know. No, but I've yeah, never exactly. personally seen an alien except for on TV. Yeah. So um, this is, you're actually, we're already connecting through this. So if you listen to this podcast for the first time and never heard about Bashar, this is how we connect, different ways. But we think someone has to come down in some type of spacecraft and land and say, take me to your leader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Doesn't need to I'm like, no, you don't want me to take you to your leader. Trust me, he won't even remember himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Wait a couple of years. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give us, we're almost in election season. Yeah, oh God. At, the, at the end of the day, it's funny because, um, uh, like Frank just described, it doesn't matter where Bashar is physically located. No. This is something that's accessible from any state, any place, any time. Because as Bashar says in his own words, everything is happening now. No. All of it now. Just in the first clip that we shared, everything is different realities. I actually really like the way... It, it helps my brain understand it the way Bashar explains the different realities as, you know, different Earths and we're just switching Earths and, you know, and there, I, I've seen like a, a photo of this. I can't explain it, but it's like hundreds of worlds stacked in line next to each other, etc. And uh, it's kind of like you're shifting from one, you're, you're physically changing the, uh, the Earth that you're on. And I thought that was very, very cool because that reality, the old reality, you know, is playing out at the exact same time your new reality is playing out. Yeah. And this whole space-time thing is also hard to wrap your head around at first, but it gets easier and easier and easier as you learn these different concepts because we were taught linear time. We were taught that this is how everything works, and that's just one way that it works. In fact, everything is happening all in this moment. And that's a, that's scientific, you know. That's Well, the, the way to actually intellectually explain that is <clears throat> if you actually have faith and understanding that everything is already done. So when I go to pick up a book and say the book is 350 pages and I'm on page three, well, 150, the, the 350th page still exists now. I just haven't experienced it. Mm -hmm. Just like um, when we were younger, like uh, before we had um, Spotify, we had to put the radio on to hopefully uh, the DJ will play the song in which you like. Now I could go directly to it. And every song I want to listen to is actually available right now, but I can only access one song at a time. So once you understand this, this is very easy to understand. You know, you don't even need scientific proof. Just look at your life. At any moment, you go on Spotify and put whatever song it is you want. As long as the artist sold it to Spotify. <laughs> once in a while, they don't. <laughs> the sons of bitches. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> but you but know that song is available example. somewhere. Somewhere that At song is available. At any given time. Where before the song was always available if you had all the records in your house and put them on there. But if you listen to the radio, you almost have to pray and wish. And that was kind of exciting though. Like, oh shit, the song came out. Everyone Original. shut up and you turn the radio on. Yeah. I remember when Napster came out and changed that whole game. Uh, well, it what it did. So everything that comes out, 
shifts everything. So it always seems like a negative or whatever. But because of that, it shifted everything the way we do things. It's more efficient now based on the old way. All right. And I think even the artists are making more money with their music than they did before. Um, I could be wrong there. I'm not certain. But at when, when Napster came out, they certainly weren't making any. Mm-hmm. They were losing. So, um, but that's what gave life to like new YouTube stuff. And well, it actually gave their views that's, on their Steve Jobs online. only did that. When yeah. Napster came out, Steve Jobs created iTunes. Oh yeah, yeah. And then he he um, you know, each song was like ninety nine cents, and I'm trying to think what his cut was like thirty, like one third or maybe maybe one quarter percent. So mm-hmm. a lot of it went to the actual musician, and now like you can put a song on Spotify yourself, and if someone watches it, listens to it. Uh, you know, I'm sure Spotify gets a little cut, but you're not paying some other manager, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, and the artist. Yeah. So, yeah, things are becoming more efficient in an individualistic way um, as we learn this. But this is just the beginning of the end, and the end of the beginning. It's a, it's a circle. It's never ending. So when you actually... So don't try to race somewhere. Don't try to get to a higher amplitude or somewhere. It's funny. Like, I'm not waiting for Bashar's uh, spaceship to land. You know... I'm aware of like extraterrestrials and spaceships, but I, I, the only time I look up at the sky is when there's no light pollution, just to see it come down on me. And if, an, if a spaceship comes down, great. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm trying to stay present. But if I'm looking, I'm not present. But if I'm experienced through my vision of what's happening, ah. Oh. And don't get me wrong, I, I, fall, I falter into um, looking. But when I just observe, I'm present. It's completely different. That's the state that we're all working towards, is what you just described. It's his observation. I'm, rather than, I'm not yeah. looking, you yeah, know. I'm observing. I'm observing. It's kind of like what Forrest Gump said. <laughs> it always cracks you up. Mm. So, you remember that scene? You saw Forrest Gump, right? Of course. And there was a scene, it was after the storm, and um, um, Captain Dan, right? Yeah, Captain Dan, was hanging off the boat, the ship. Like all, They were out the water, so their ship didn't get destroyed like a lot of them did in the harbor. So they're here they're on the boat. The storm is gone. It's just calm. It's peaceful. Sun's out. And you see Captain Dan. Something happened. So the, the metaphor of the story was the storm came, but now the calmness. So um, Captain Dan was holding on to something. He was very angry because he lost his legs. But all of a sudden, when the storm ended, the morning arises, and he's like sitting there swinging from this rope that's holding his body up at, at the edge of the boat. And he's like, you could see this overwhelming peace came over him. And he looks to Forrest, he goes, hey, Forrest, have you found Jesus? And Forrest looks at him like, I didn't know we were looking for him. <laughs> <laughs> because he was already in that state, he didn't need to look. And that's the brilliance of that story. I, people probably get tired of repeating it, but the one thing Forrest was hoping for had to die before he could realize it, and that was Jenny. Everything else came to him. He wasn't looking for it. He wasn't looking for it, but he wanted to make Jenny happy, and he couldn't. Her death is a metaphor of he had to let go of that. And then they produced a son. And then he was happy. So in that story, when you're chasing something, it's going to evade you. But when you allow it, um, amazing things, you end up opening, you know, you think about all the things he went through. He didn't, you know, he didn't want to meet the president, several of them. He didn't want to be a ping pong champion. He didn't want to run all that way. Mm -hmm. He just did. He allowed it. So when, we, when you look at that movie or look at life and you start to allow, amazing things happen. But whatever you chase, it must die in order for you to experience it. So stop chasing. Or at least try to. But I don't like the word try because it means you're not. Mm-hmm. I tell to all my clients, like, I don't want to hear the word try. And then I'll say, try not to say try. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, I, I just said it myself. Son of a bitch. <laughs> I uh, I love today's episode. Yeah. Bashar, he, there, he's so much truth, so much very concise, well-defined, well, easy to understand, simple truths come from this entity. Uh, I can't cur- encourage you guys enough to, to truly listen. There is a lot of good content out there on YouTube. Um, do you know when he's coming? I need to see uh, Bashar. Yeah, look up Bashar. He, he's, I need to look him up he, and see. He's going to go to Sedona again soon. Yeah, but he, he's even... I, I've gone to L.A. a couple times to see him. Have you? Yeah, so he's from L.A., so I think well, he had, well, One cool thing that we should mention, too, so Daryl Anka, who channels Bashar, he's worked on some really cool, like... Uh, uh, like I was reading how he did, like, the Star Trek stuff. You know, yeah, yeah. he did, like, the models well, for he, that. Yeah, he started out in filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, he still owns a film company with his wife, it was saying. Yeah, Z, and I they think it's Zia, Zia Films, I believe it's okay. called. Yeah. 
And so, I mean, like, yeah, he, he's got a cool story, too. Is, is that where he currently lives? California? Yeah, L.A. area. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually, he won't give me his address. <laughs> <laughs> he's just probably for, for the best. I, uh, <laughs> I, I definitely want to visit and, and be part of one of these Bashar, you know, experiences because it's just yeah, it's and cool. It, if you can't, there's a lot of content out there where he's actually doing it in front. Of, like we showed a couple of clips. Actually, all the clips are live, mm-hmm. and that's that's where it's like I, there are there are uh, um, podcasts and stuff like that where um, Daryl is being interviewed, not necessarily bringing out Bashar. Those are really cool to watch. You get a little insight from his vantage point. But when you listen to people ask questions, a beautiful thing about it is when I go to Bashar, what they do is they have you write down questions, mm-hmm. and you write it down what you want to ask, and then you put it in a you know, in a basket or whatever, yeah. and then they'll pull from it. So, and then um, they'll pull you up to ask the question. Well, every time I've never got pulled up to ask a question, but my an- my question was answered every time. Yeah, every time. So I like now I'm like, am I gonna write shit down? Mm-hmm. I, and now I go down. I don't have a question. I go in, and I don't have a question. But when I go, I learn something new every time. I'm like, wow, how does this keep happening? Yeah. And that's the amazing thing. I don't go in with any insistence on this needs to be answered i sit back and because even i could see people ask questions and it's funny because bishar will catch him on this they ask a question they'll answer okay and he moves on to the next one he goes did you not like that answer <laughs> like they weren't even absorbing <laughs> what yeah. you were asking he gave them the answer and they moved on and but yet from a vantage point of the audience i was able to sit there i'm like wow wow all right how it, many people were in the room when you saw him oh would you say 500 or would you say no, 20? No, not that. No, no, more than 20. Uh, upward of maybe 200, 300. I, I, it's That's very a lot of people tell. in the room. Yeah, it, it's, you know, yeah. You know, it, it was sold out, I'll tell uh-huh. you that. So they just rented out this, uh, you know, it was at a hotel and they rented out this conference room. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I can't tell you truth. Maybe a couple hundred, 300 maybe. That's cool. Uh, but it was definitely sold out. It was, yeah, yeah no, yeah. I had, I had to keep something on my seat so I don't want to take it, sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> See, that is... But there wasn't a bad seat in the house, though, so it didn't matter. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny because I remember going there, first time I seen him, I'm hanging out near the pool, and it wasn't to that evening he was um, going to be talking. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember hanging out there, and all of a sudden I see him come walking up. and see him walk around? Yeah, like, he's walking right by me. I'm like, Daryl. And he looked at me like, hey. and like he's like, oh, you know me? I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he realized, oh, I'm here for the conference. It was just funny the way I got caught him. And he's yeah, very yeah. pleasant. Nice. That was cool that you He's saw very him. approachable, by the way. Oh, I'm sure. He's kind of quiet off the side, but he is approachable. You can come up to him. But, um, you know, I just I just say, hey, Daryl. You know, because it was funny. The first time I saw him, like, he was like, You're right like, where you yeah. are. You're yeah. like, there he is. That's him. Yeah. That's it's, awesome. Yeah. yeah, you can tell. Um, it, it, you're right. It, there is a difference between him and... Uh, the entity Bashar, yeah, because I've watched interviews of just Daryl Inka, yeah. and he is very much more soft spoken, you know, quite easygoing guy, etc. And then Bashar is direct, but you know, yes. to the point. He's funny, bizarre. Like he'll actually mm-hmm. like he'll scold people. Yeah, he makes good jokes. Yeah, I remember this one guy was trying to. I was watching one. And we could sit here and talk all day about it, but he was trying to um, bring in this idea of these um, uh, conspiracy theories, mm-hmm. and he was saying that's your belief. He goes, are you telling, and the guy's like, are you telling me everyone here is looking at different? He goes, yes, that's what I'm saying. And the guy kept going and Bashar goes, stop, and just shut the guy down. We are not here to discuss this stuff, all right? You can you can hold on to that, but what I'm telling you is you're living in a different world than everybody else here. But if you want to feed it into, you're wasting your time at this, um, at this conference. And matter of fact, the more you actually talk about conspiracy theories, the more you strengthen them. Mm-hmm. You know, the more you talk about whatever you don't want, strengthen. So if you want to strengthen abundance, talk about that. Mm-hmm. If you want to, sh- you know, but if you want to strengthen poverty or lack. Or pain or suffering. Yeah. It, when you talk about it, you will strengthen it, period. It's physics. This is not philosophy. This is actual physics. So learn to talk about something that that moves you. And then more of it will come, more of it will come, more of it will come. But if you talk about stuff that doesn't, like your your sorrows and your pain, more of that comes. And you're like, see, yeah, everyone's right. Everyone's exactly right. But which right do you want to be? One that's working for you or against you in, in the movement of which we all naturally move in a higher level. We're, we're made to naturally move higher. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so there's plenty of content out there on YouTube. Check them out. If you do get a chance, um, you know, he's been doing this for 40 years. I don't want to sound like... Um, 
like with the Rolling Stones, but you never know when he'll stop. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Check know? him out, especially Check him you know, out if he's you in go your live. area. There's something about being live with him, just the people around it. It's the just, energy. It's really full. Yeah. And yeah. he's successful. He, he, he does it in California, like in L.A. area. He's got his own YouTube channel, too. So go on there and check yeah. out that content. That's great. And he'll talk about the stuff. But on his website, it'll tell you when the events are. I know he does a lot of stuff in Sedona. But I, I'm not sure where else he travels. I'm just lucky that I live in where I live because it's easy for me to get to uh, L.A. or it's easy, very easy for me to get to Sedona. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another cool thing is check him out on Gaia. Again, there's that channeling documentary that just came out. It's literally called First channeling. Contact. Yeah, well, First Contact. Yeah. He's in that. He's also he, in... He um, actually made that one. That was him? That, that was his, his, his uh, Zia uh, films. Even better. Yeah. And then he's also um, on, like, they have the LA, like, Conscious Life Expos. Yeah. Those two are great. Yeah, he's he's always... I think he goes to them a lot. And, so check out, check him out on that. And it's funny because he, whenever he goes to those, he, uh, I think, has the largest audience. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. He definitely. <laughs> does yeah. because i remember i watched a billy carson episode <laughs> one time and billy was talking about it. i show up and i see this line out front and he's like oh, oh man this would be great and then he realized everyone was going to bashar <laughs> and he's like oh shit i need a channel yeah i need a channel yeah you know billy carson's great though so yeah check yeah. them both out yep <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for joining us this week guys if you like what you heard uh leave us a comment below you know if there's somebody you would like us to see us cover or uh you think would be a good person for frank and i to research send us a message you know uh perspective shift 2020 at gmail is how you can reach us that's probably the easiest way to contact us and we'll be we'll be here next week guys another thing we're going to start doing is uh we talked about this over the last week uh week or two but, um, you know, we've been in this show about three years now. We're getting a lot of um, people writing in and sending emails and stuff like that. And a couple of times we, we take the emails and we do the spotlight. Mm-hmm. But what we're actually going to start doing is anyone has a great story of their journey, uh, write in. And uh, we would like to feature you actually on the show as an interviewee. Yeah, we would like to interview you. Yeah, we'd like you. to. Do that. So we got our first one coming up um next yeah next um, week next week yeah so we rather do that than just take your email and and you know go through it and talk about it we actually like to have you on so we want to start featuring that that's something new we're going to do here on perspective shift we're going to bring the audience into the show um a little closer yep and we like that because we all you know it doesn't matter where you are your story is just as fabulous as anybody else's story so we'd like to hear it and your journey along the way of not just listen to us, but just going down this uh, road of consciousness and mm-hmm. expansion. All right? I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too, man. I'm I excited. Yeah. So we'll be chatting with a lot of you guys here soon. We're excited yeah. to have you on. We'll, we'll set up Zoom calls, all that good stuff. Yeah, so and if you want to be on, just email us and let us know. And you can just give a brief. You don't have to tell us the whole story. We'll you know, just give a brief setting of it, and then we'll... Uh, We'll find out on air is what yeah. me and Mike like That's to do. That's going to be a fun part. You know, yeah. It will be a good uh, back and forth. It will give us time to answer questions, us time to ask questions, and vice versa. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be fun. It'll be, I'm excited about this. Yeah, me too. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. All right. Much love and peace out. Thanks all. all right.